Well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'll be your host today, and we are delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, the professional leader in business, whether you're an aspiring woman leader or a woman leading people or projects, teams, or a company company or even your own business. We select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Our webinar is just shy of an hour, and around the half hour mark, we will be answering any questions that you have submitted online. So at the top of your screen, or possibly at the bottom of your screen, you should see a choice for Q&A. So any questions that you have, just go ahead and submit them there. And um, I'll be interacting with our guest today um, and asking some questions of her as, as well. The focus of our webinar today is Stuck, Love Your Work Again. I love the title of this. And I am very excited to introduce our thought leader for today, Linda Lotto. So let me tell you a little bit about Linda. Linda was born and raised in Alaska and grew up admiring women who raced with their dog teams in the Alaskan Iditarod, a 938 mile winter dog sled race from Anchorage to Nome. This event was not only about winning, but finishing and achieving a dream by rising to a personal challenge. And inspired by this, Linda always knew she wanted to help others find and achieve their career aspirations and begin coaching individuals to successfully achieve the job of their dreams in 2008. Now, as a result of the growing number of individuals who have awakened to the realization that they are meant to do fulfilling work, work that they're passionate about, Linda created a program called Chart Your Path 30. Linda's Chart Your Path 30 program is based on the successes of herself and others in achieving rapid transformation in, from feeling stuck to creating a structured plan to do the work that they love. Now, Linda has a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's in organizational leadership. She specializes in change management and transformational leadership, and she is a senior human resources professional and certified project management professional, a John Maxwell certified coach, trainer, and speaker, and a passionate advocate for empowering women in reaching their dreams, which is exactly why we have her here today uh, presenting this fabulous topic to us. So Linda, welcome. Thank you, Patty. I'm really excited to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about how I help women who feel stuck in their jobs and find out how to do something they love again. Um, so let me just advance here. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, do what you love. Every day I talk to somebody who wants to make a change in what they do but they just don't know how to do it. And I've been there myself. And just to clarify, I'm not actually talking about um, people who want to get a promotion or growing in their profession or dealing with a difficult boss or problem employee. That's actually a different conversation than the one I'm going to have here. I'm actually talking about women who um, are just not feeling excited or passionate about what they're doing anymore. And maybe they've been thinking of something that they would really like to do, but they just don't know how they can replace their income. And often they have an idea of something that they've always wanted to do, but just don't know how to transition into something they've been dreaming about. And sometimes they don't even know what they want to do, but they just have this overwhelming feeling that they need to do something different and uh, something or something that they were meant to do. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay here in the slides. Let me see. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. The juggle. Are you missing your spark? As women, we often are juggling so many things. We don't have a lot of time for reflection. We're so busy going from day to day, taking care of our families, making sure the kids get to soccer or after school play and catching up with work. And because we're so busy, 
we don't know when that spark or that feeling of being passionate about when our work, uh, about our work went out. And sometimes, let's face it, we took a job that was just supposed to pay the bills or help make ends meet, and we were promoted up for more money and more responsibility, and pretty soon, we're just doing a job, and it was never our dream job or something we loved. It just fulfilled a function, and that is totally okay. When life slows down or there are major changes at work, it is then that we some, sometimes we step back and say, I don't really want to do this anymore. Yep, been there, done that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I have too. So sometimes we just miss the signals. I can speak for myself. I was in a job that was my dream job. I loved it. And I missed the signals. And I feel really kind of embarrassed to say that because I'd already helped coach a lot of people on how to get their dream jobs. But some of these signals are that it's been years since you've had a real vacation or you just can't get away from work for more than a week or you have a hard time waking up in the morning, Monday through Friday, or being irritated with coworkers or employees, getting involved with office drama, feeling like the same scenario plays out over and over and over, resenting the new boss because they're just inept, feeling obligated, you don't wanna be at company events or maybe you know, leading certain teams, but you just don't wanna let people down because they have come to rely on you. Uh, management decisions seem illogical or oppressive, um, feeling like the new accounting system or whatever else, um, the other change that's happening is going to just ruin everything, or just that the office games are annoying. But I can tell you, uh, awesome women often outgrow their jobs. Mm. It's just like a pair of shoes. Shoes wear out and jobs also wear out. Believe it or not, most of the women I talk to would surprise you. They are often women who have successful careers and maybe they've climbed the corporate ladder and they're now in a top level position or they've achieved professional success in their field. Some of them have owned their own businesses and have done so for a long time and they make good money in their business or they're in a transitional job because they just had to get out of where they were and get some space to think. And no matter who they are, they are always good at what they do, but they just don't wanna do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I propose you take a leap, but not a wild jump. And sometimes people have already taken a wild jump when I end up talking to them. <laughs> They've already you know, left their job, you know, and I almost took a wild jump myself, but I, I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't. Um, but it's perfect if you um, wanna make a change, because I can relate to this. I've actually revamped my career more than once before, and I was lucky because early on, I learned how to do some of the groundwork to move into a job I loved versus just randomly going or making the wild jump. But that doesn't mean it was easy for me. And it certainly, in hindsight, could have been a quicker path to what I wanted to do than what I took. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one of the things that I always reflect on is um, there are some awesome assessment tools out there that help with the process of figuring out what to do next. And when I first started my career, I didn't know how to use the I didn't know how to use these assessments that were available and the ones that were available weren't entirely helpful. In fact, early on, I took a job analysis assessment in high school because it was part of our career planning option. And the result was that I should be a beekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you right now that being a beekeeper was not on my radar screen when I was 18 years old, and I certainly didn't have the skill set to make a living being a beekeeper. So not all assessments are built the same. <laughs> so science and reality, now that there are some really great assessments, there are some awesome assessments that can be used together to create a helpful tool to keep your ideas and plans of what to do next realistic. And so letting go. So it sounds counterintuitive, but you have to make room uh, and let go of what no longer works and serves you, 
in order to make room for what does serve you and, and for what's next in your life. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm getting ready for work, I feel like I have a closet full of clothes, but I don't have anything to wear. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I take a Saturday morning and take out all the clothes that don't fit or don't look good anymore, or I just don't feel good wearing, and I keep passing through, after I do this, I can, um, and I toss all those clothes away or give them to Goodwill, I open my closet and I realize, oh, well, well, this is why I didn't have anything to wear because I really don't have anything to wear. Um, and then I add the clothes that I love to wear or I have rediscovered the clothes I love to wear and suddenly I do have things mm -hmm. in my closet that I can pick to wear. Yeah. And the same thing goes, you know, I mean, the same thing goes for when you're trying, you know, if you have a job and you're busy with your life, you have to let go of certain things in order to make room for the next thing. Good. So I think that um, we all suffer from, you know, having too many things, but there are some deeper things that hold us down. And I call these the three bandits of freedom. And the three bandits of freedom are money, identity, and the question of what's next. And these bandits have stolen our freedom without us really realizing they have taken over. Because we've been so busy, we haven't realized that they've crept in and they've kept us from doing what we really want to do. They keep us from making a change. But if we disarm these bandits, we can clear a path forward to an exciting and fulfilling work that makes us feel like we're doing something with purpose. And so let me just dive into here the different bandits individually. So the money bandit. Um, we can't compare apples to oranges when it comes to money. And what do I mean by that? Well, most of us are stuck in thinking that when we think about doing something different, we have to move from one job to the next job, replacing our current income dollar for dollar. And even if you're looking for a promotion in your current line of work, this is absolutely an inaccurate and illogical thinking that holds us back. So when you think about it, if you are making X number of dollars in your job, the rule of thumb is that, oh, you should go ahead and, and make, you know, 5% more if you're getting a promotion. And I don't think so. In fact, I know that that's not the case. You should always get paid for the work that you do. So when we start looking at money as just a tool that we use to live our lives, we can actually free ourselves from this limited thinking of unrealistic pay expectations that hold us back from exploring what we really want to do. So money is a tool, just like a lot of things. Um, the, matter, the fact of the matter is, is that if you move to a job that you loved, you might make less money than you currently earn now. But I can say that most people I work with, when they um, love what they do, they actually end up making more money than, than they currently earn. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Sometimes it happens right away. Sometimes it happens pretty much immediately. But replacing a job that you feel stuck in with a job that makes you feel alive again is so invigorating. It gives you so much energy. And there are adjustments that you can make to ensure that your money needs are met while you're building your income in the next job that you actually feel passionate about. Mm -hmm. So the next bandit of our freedom is the identity bandit. And the identity bandit hides behind the question of what's next. So the identity bandit is really hard to see. But if you realize that they're hiding, that identity bandit is hiding behind that question of what's next, then you can actually disarm this bandit. And so the identity bandit tells you that you are what you do. And this is a big fat lie. Yeah. Don't fall for it. You are not your job. You are so, so much more than your job. But when we do a job for a long time and we get good at it, we start to see and identify ourselves as our jobs. We are a lawyer, we're an accountant, we're a business owner, we're a boss. 
And then we worry about what other people will think if we're no longer what we do. Mm -hmm. But the identity bandit is actually, it looks bigger than it actually is. The fact is we are complex beings and we are many things to many people. And the truth is we have many chapters in our lives as well. So we have to detach ourselves from these labels and decide what we want to do next. And we don't have to be what we have been. So the last bandit is the what's next question. And the question of what's next can be the easiest bandit to disarm, and it can also be the most difficult bandit to disarm. And so many times when I talk to somebody who has decided that they're going to make a change and do something that matters to them, that makes a difference in the world, or that they have always felt a calling to do, and they have a life event that brings them to this decision. And what do I mean by this? Waking up. So a few years ago, I was coasting in a job, a really good job, and I was good at my job, and I was making a difference in an organization that I was a part of. But the truth is, I had accomplished what I had came to do, and I was coasting. And I was comfortable. And I was extremely busy with other parts of my life, and I was stretched too thin and not really actively thinking about moving on to the next phase of my career. I just had a loose plan at that point to move on at some point. But what jolted me? Well, a close friend of mine who was a marathon runner, crossfitter, non-smoker, an extremely health conscious, healthy eater was diagnosed with stage four lung, lung cancer. And she passed away seven and a half months later after her diagnosis at the age of 42, wow. leaving behind three children the oldest of which was just entering high school. In her last months, she would repeat to everyone, don't wait. And I didn't wait. Combined with um, that event, combined with three weeks of deep reflection that I, I happened to have happen, I decided that my life wasn't going to coast anymore. I was going to get up and I was going to do what I needed to do to realize my dream of working for myself and making a difference on a larger scale and helping others achieve their dreams and reach their potential. Life is good. Don't wait. My friend didn't. She did what she loved. And she grasped life fully and completely and she didn't wait to do the things she wanted to do. And she was happy. Her job was what she wanted to do. And it was also how she earned a living and supported her ability to be the kind of mom and community member she wanted to be. And she made a difference, not only for her family, but, she, but for so many other people that she influenced, including me. And you can do what you love too. You don't have to wait to lose a loved one, have a cancer scare, a serious accident, to decide that you want to live your dream. You deserve to be happy doing what you love. Don't wait. The world is waiting. So how do we make this change? Well, the first thing we need to do is we have to disarm these bandits. And then we have to take a look at what are our key motivators. And when I'm working with people, I use some assessments to um, determine key motivators. And these assessments are combined together to give more of a complete picture, because I've taken so many assessments that would make your head spin. And none of them are perfect by themselves, but when you look at a couple of really good ones and then kind of look at, at a combination of all of those factors, you can really get down deep. And sometimes your key motivators surprise you. Also reflection. I build in some reflection time into the process. And then it's creating a plan, appreciating what you have already and where you have been and how your path has taken you to this moment. And then it's also a process of letting go. <laughs> so these bandits, <laughs> step one, you have, to, you have to disarm these bandits of freedom, the money, the identity, and the questions of what next. And I know I made that sound really easy and I kind of glossed over it quickly, but it is not easy. It does require some work. 
And if you drop me an email, I'd be happy to send you worksheets that I've developed to help you through the process of disarming these bandits. And I'll also include a planning sheet to help you figure out a plan. So what really makes your heart sing? Well, second, the second step in this process is you have to do a deep dive into understanding what your key motivators are. And no matter how well you think you know yourself, exploring this with some external tools is that vital piece of the process. And this keeps your heart from taking over and will distill an element of logic and practicality to the process. Because objectivity is really important to developing a realistic plan. You know, you always hear about people who, oh, I've always dreamed I wanted to be an astronaut. Well, you have to have a plan that is realistic to get you there. And it isn't that your dream is unrealistic, but you have to combine some elements to create a logical, realistic path to get there. Because I can tell you that no one wants to change jobs or do something different only to discover that it isn't what you hoped it would be. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that can be really difficult. And I, I always liken that to, you know, people who say, oh, you know, I, I've always wanted to be a vet or I've always wanted to be, um, you know, a, a specific, uh, like an architect. Well, then they, they go to school and, and school is one thing. And then they actually get into the job and then they realize, you know, I actually don't really enjoy many parts of this and I thought I would and I don't. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to avoid when we're making these plans. So that's why I build in some reflection time because it's not always just, you know, the, the head work of figuring out the logic of the plan. It's also about going within and really reflecting because after you have that objective information that you can consider and you have taken control over the bandits that are holding you back, then it is time to reflect and this takes work. It is not easy. It doesn't take 10 minutes. It, it takes a little bit of time. And you have to build time into your schedule to, to really do that good, deep reflection work. And I have some journaling exercises that I help to help spur people into getting into that deeper area. But it's, this is such a critical part of the process. And no one can do this work except you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any answers for anyone. The answers are within each of my clients. And so, you know, I've found that if you have someone help guide you through the process and ask you those tough questions that will, and, and those are the tough questions that will be incredibly helpful to the process of going in and reflecting, you know, and getting those authentic answers from within. Because no matter what, in this stage, you do not want to talk to someone who has all the answers or who thinks they know it all and you know what's best for you and they're willing to share that information with you and that will derail you from your process and it has to be your authentic process and no one else's process which is why sometimes you know friends are a great sounding board um, but sometimes they know you too well and they think they know what's best for you and they may not know what's best for you mm -hmm. So the next part is to create a realistic and actionable plan. And a plan turns a dream into a reality. A realistic plan is likely not about leaving your job this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was at a stage where I wanted to leave my job that very day, but yes. I, I... Not come back from lunch, right? <laughs> exactly. I almost did that, Patty. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't, I, and it wasn't just once that I almost did it. I almost did it three different times, and it wasn't because I was having a bad day at work. It was just that I was overwhelmed with the feeling of this is totally not what I'm supposed to be doing, and so that I can't authentically be here because I feel like a fraud. <laughs> yeah, but that's not that's not a good idea. <laughs> so this is about making that realistic. Um, plan with actionable steps and that you can move forward on your goal. And the next part is really about appreciating and letting go. The best part about the plan is that you will find that no matter how much you dislike where you are or what you're doing, once you have a plan in place, 
what I find is that you feel happy and excited and alive again because now your current work is exactly where it's supposed to be in your perspective, which is just a chapter of your life that you are in the process of saying goodbye to. And then you can also see the new chapter ahead and you just can't wait to read it. But you can appreciate where you are. And it is important to fully appreciate where you are and what you have been and everything that it has given to you. Because when you know that you have a plan to leave, you may be surprised to see the things about your current situation that you had not really appreciated before. Mm, so, yeah, the colleagues, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you, sometimes it's about the restaurants that are in the area. Sometimes it's about colleagues that you would really miss and you've kind of, you know, taken them for granted because they're in, you know, in your environment day after day. But sometimes you think, oh gosh, you know, I'll really miss that person if I'm not here anymore. And sometimes it's just like, oh, well, I have a desk next to the window and I can see these beautiful flowers outside. It's just important to really, no matter how you feel about your situation, to really take the time to appreciate each part and let go of each of those parts, good and bad. Well, it can certainly improve your perspective, you know, at that point. And, yes. um, you know, I, I liked what you said about making a plan. I think when you, whatever the situation is, uh, making a plan gives you a sense of control. You know, you, you feel like you're not a victim. You feel like you've taken some control of the situation. Yes. Yes. That's, that's really true. And, and when you don't have a plan and you just hate what you're doing, um, you don't feel that sense of control. You feel like, you know, your life is just, you know, going from one moment to the next to the one, ne one day to the next. And you're right. And then I think it's partly that sense of control when you have an actionable plan. You feel like you're back in the driver's seat of your life. And that makes you feel happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but but just just having a plan you know, makes a lot of people feel nervous unless they know that that plan is something that they can realistically execute. And that's kind of where the difference is. Otherwise, it just feels like, oh, I don't know if I want to. And it still feels scary, you know, to take the big, you know, the, the little, the little jump <laughs> and into your future. But um, you're right. So uh, 30 days is all it has to take. Every one of us has unique gifts and talents and using those talents is a calling we need to fulfill. And no matter who you are or where you are or your professional background, it only takes 30 days to change your work life. And if you're willing to take the time to reflect and determine what you want to do and understand that and resolve that what is really holding you back, those three bandits of freedom, mm -hmm. Create a realistic plan to move forward into a job that you feel passionate about and you can't wait to wake up and do every day. And there's one thing I do know, especially because of the lesson my friend taught me, life is too short not to love what you do. So thank you. That's really the end of my quick webinar. Um, I did mention some worksheets that can help you disarm the three bandits of money, identity, and what's next, and a planning sheet for creating your plan forward. You can either go to my website, which is www.chartyourpath30.com, and send me an email, or you can send me an email at igneoconsulting at gmail.com. And definitely mention CWI and get these worksheets for free. And thank you for having me. Oh, it, this has just been fabulous. Um, really, really great, Linda, and such good information. And we will um, go back to, I'm going to go back to your previous slide there, just so we make sure that we've got your contact information there. And we do have some questions um, that have been coming in. And I know that the folks that are online and listening are probably um, just feeling as full of information as I'm feeling right now. And, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, all the things you talked about, about why we, we get stuck in a place, you know, is, is I, I can say yes, 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 you know, to all of those. So, um, and I, you know, one of the things was, um, 
uh, a question that had come in at the very beginning that you then went ahead and answered was, you know, I, I hate my job, so should I just quit? And sometimes that's a, that's a big leap off a super scary cliff, you know, and, and so your solution to that or your suggestion to that was going through and working a plan, you know, making a plan, charting your path and figuring out what you're going to do. And, and ultimately you may decide, yeah, it's time to just quit. It's time to take that big leap, but at least thinking about it, you know, and contemplating what you ought to do is, um, is much more pragmatic, I would say, than just, you know, take this job and shove it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, I will say that, um, I have, I have had a couple of clients who either have already just left their job. Mm. Uh, and, and that there, sometimes there are situations, depending upon your unique circumstances, there are some situations that do warrant just getting up and leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't provide any specific um, examples, um, but I can tell you that that is not a, completely off the table option. It's just that for most people, um, that isn't probably the best option because having a plan in place, you know, most people have to work for a living. Yeah. <laughs> Paying the bills is important. And so, you know, as tempting as it is sometimes just to walk away, um, there is value in the process of actually letting go of where you are um, with closure. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, what about, what if you, you maybe don't like the job that you do, that you're doing, but you really like the company? What, what can people do in that situation? Well, you know, that's actually a really great opportunity that a lot of people overlook. Um, that can lead to something that I call job sculpting. Because sometimes somebody is in a fabulous company and they like a lot of the people that they work with. And this often happens in a larger organization. Um, I used to work for Kaiser Permanente, for example, and you know, Kaiser is such a huge company and I love the company, I love their purpose, I loved everything about it, but you know, I had different jobs that were not exactly you know, getting me where I wanted to go or I wasn't even passionate about anymore. And so you can do something called job sculpting and, you know, it's still worth going through a process where you um, look at your key motivators, figure out why, what parts of your job are working for you, what parts of any job work for you. And then sometimes you can then get a different kind of position in the same company. Sometimes in other organizations or even in large ones or small ones, you can work with your boss, especially if you have a great relationship with your boss and say, look, could we maybe you know, add some of these other tasks and maybe move these other tasks off to somebody else because I found that I'm really passionate about these things and I'm really good at these types of things. And I think I can bring more value if I'm doing what I'm passionate about. And most of the time, you know, if you have a good relationship with your boss and they, they understand key motivators, they can help you uh, sculpt your job into something that you feel energized about, especially if they realize that they're going to lose you if mm -hmm. they don't help you figure out how to stay. Right. And if they can understand that they'll have a much more productive um, employee if they work with you to sculpt that job into, into something that meets your passion and, and your best talents and skills. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's not always money. A lot of times, you know, the common thing is when they realize they're going to lose a valuable employee, they think, oh, well, if we just throw more money at this person, we'll keep mm -hmm. them. But it's sometimes it's not about money. Yes. Um, it, it's about, it's about just wanting to love what you do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, you mentioned, you know, working with a boss that you, that you get along well, that you have a good relationship with. What about some of the other things? Like, um, like maybe you enjoy the job you're doing, but you're finding the culture of the company or the person you're working for is just not a good fit. You know, what is that important, I guess? And what would you suggest to people that find themselves in that spot? 
Well, certainly um, that can happen um, to anyone. They're chugging along, they love what they do. But I would also say that when you look at it from a more of a bird's eye view, um, sometimes a company is starting to change direction in where they're going and not everything stays the same. And so then a person is faced with, can I adapt? to where this company is going and how they're evolving, evolve with the changes, or is it now not really a fit? Because sometimes we think our job is a certain way and we're told, oh, well, we've just gotten this new system that automates everything that you do. So, you know, you need to find other ways of doing your, your job. Mm -hmm. and those ways may not be a fit for you anymore. And so, so that's part of the process is to analyze where you currently are and why it's not feeling like a fit. And sometimes it's, you know, maybe you had a boss that you loved and then a new boss comes in. Well, almost every time when a new boss comes in, um, they were hired because the company or the managers above that position have decided that they want to pull the the organization in another direction or maybe expand in some new directions and so you have to look at it strategically right. from that bird's eye view right right you know i i loved the story you told about your friend um because i i've found in in my own life and in people that i have worked with that those life defining moments are are really you know, they just slap you in the face and they force you to be reflective when you've gotten stuck and you're just going through the motions, you know, and, and so forth. And um, in my own situation, it was when I, I went through a divorce, a very sudden divorce at 42. And I suddenly was the sole breadwinner, uh, you know, for raising three kids. And, you know, I was doing a job I absolutely hated at the time and had been trying to get out of and suddenly was thrust back to, I can't, I've got to stay, I've got to make this money. What am I going to do now? You know, and how do I, how do I get out of this place and still take care of my family and take care of what I need to do? And it was very, one of the things that came out of that was that I made up my mind I was never going to be stuck like that again. I, I was never going to be doing a job that I had no choice about, you know, and whether that meant finding something that I loved to do or, you know, improving my education so I had a better chance of getting different jobs or uh, not marrying an asshole again, you know, <laughs> something like that. I was going to make sure I wasn't ever in that spot, you know. So do you, I'm sure you have had clients that were just like I was. And, and yes. was some of the, what were some of the turnarounds that you saw with them? Well, you know, um, I, that is a very, I mean, everybody's story is unique and different, but, um, I, and I have been in a situation where, I was stuck in a job I didn't like, but you know what? I was a sole breadwinner for two kids and I provided our family's health insurance and I had an absolute horrible boss, but I charted my path out of there. Mm -hmm. And it took, it. unfortunately in that particular case, um, you know, because of my finances, I, I could not have a gap in my income. And so it took about a year before I was able to move, well, eight months. It, was, mm -hmm. it took eight months to move into a job that I, I loved again. Um, but that's what kept me afloat mentally was, yeah. you know, doing that. But a lot of women I talked to, they um, had a cancer scare. And they decided at that moment in time that they were going to do, they weren't going to be stuck anymore. Mm -hmm. and, or, you know, they lost a parent who modeled doing what they loved and they said you know what i i'm not going to do that in my case you know i've had several times where i've had to remake my career and um i i had i had the same kind of epiphany i'm never going to be stuck again mm -hmm. i'm going to make sure i have certifications and education that is going to put me in a position where i can get a job without being stuck somewhere and without any options right right 
Yeah, that's not a happy place to be. It's know? not. It's yeah. it's um it's a very miserable place and you know that's why I'm so passionate about this program because I have been there and I have um I know how painful it can be and I also know that you don't have to stay there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What would you say about um, about education? You know, if if uh, a woman decides that she needs to go back to school or she needs to uh, update her skills or something, uh, I remember deciding to go back and finish my degree because I had been doing it, you know, piecemeal here and there, and then finally thought, man, I need to get serious about this, you know, so. I, I went back to school and finished my undergrad and then really wanted to go for my master's and convinced myself I was just too old to do that. And I had a friend who said, well, how old will you be if you don't go back to school? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> so I'm sure you hear those kinds of excuses. No, I'm too old or no, I'm too busy or no, I'm too broke or I'm too, you know, whatever. So what is some of your um, advice in that situation? Well, I can tell you right now, it is your life and you should live it to the max. And I can, I, if you just Google grandmother goes back to college, yeah. you will find story after story after story about someone who may have even retired from their career and they decided I am going back and I'm getting that degree that I always wanted to have. Yeah. It is never too late. And it, and you know, the bottom line is don't ever cheat yourself yeah. out of a future because you say, Oh, I'm too old. You know what? Just like your friend said, you're, you will be whatever age you're going to be five years from now, regardless of whether you go back and get that degree or not. Right. Right. And then kicking yourself for not going back and doing it. Yeah. And then you're five <laughs> years older and you still haven't done it. Exactly. Exactly. It, it was, it was very rewarding, um, especially in my situation because I was forced to have a different perspective just by the sheer virtue of being in a classroom with other students and hearing their experiences and, um, you know, learning that I did have something to share and I did have something to give and I had things to learn from, you know, from these other students as well. So it, it was one of the most rewarding things that I ever, ever did and certainly opened the door for new opportunities. Absolutely. And, you know, just like you, Patty, I went back and got my master's degree later on in my life as well. And it was for a couple of reasons. One, um, I didn't have the money when I graduated from undergrad to get my master's degree. And it was important to me to have a master's degree, but I also wanted it to mean something. And then, you know, kids came and jobs and, you know, other responsibilities, and it was never a good time. And then I, I took three years and I found the program I wanted and then it was time and I yeah. went for it and I, and I don't have any regrets. I mean, it was awesome and it happened exactly when it needed to happen because like you, I found that I had more to give and because of my experience, I had different perspectives on things than I would have had without that experience. Right, right. I totally agree. Totally agree. Well, I'm going to um, show your, your, um, your contact information slide again, if I can okay. suddenly get this screen to, there we go. <laughs> Every once in a while it just says, no, I've gone to sleep. I'm not going to, I'm not going to perform. <laughs> um, for anyone who's listening or, uh, or watches the recording afterwards, when we put this on YouTube, this is how you can get a hold of Linda and take advantage of her uh, chart your path, her 30 day program to, you know, really determining what are the next steps in your life. So before we, you know, call this a day, uh, what will somebody know at the end of that 30 days? I mean, I know that their life won't be completely different at the end of 30 days. What will they have at the end of that time? Well, uh, I first I need to say that some of the common um, questions that I have is that, well, I'm going on vacation in the middle of that, you know, 
No, 30 days if you can commit to doing your exercises every single week uh, for four weeks, because sometimes people are in a rush mm -hmm. and they, they're like, I have to get out of my job right now. And it's like, <laughs> okay, give yourself 30 days. And on the flip side, some people say, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to do something in 30 days. I, I need a couple of months to kind of feel, okay, that's okay too. Um, but what they'll have at the end and it, let's just say they do have the time to do their exercises for four weeks in a row. At the end of that 30 days, what they'll have is they will have an authentic plan that they can then say, okay, I know when I'm going to, you know, start the process. And it's usually right away of getting out of where I am now and getting to where I want to be. And that, right there is so powerful because right. even if you are miserable where you are, what you will find, I mean, I haven't worked with anybody yet who hasn't felt this way. When they have a plan that they know not only is authentically them from their heart, but also makes sense from a intellectual logical level, that they have a plan that they know they can execute and they've gotten through the three bandits of freedom, they feel alive again, even if they haven't changed their job. They, they know that they have a new chapter that they can't wait to get to, and they're getting there every day because they're putting in steps to get there. Wow. And how empowering, you know, that is going to feel. Yes. Yes. It's very empowering because now the tables are turned. Now you're in the driver's seat of your life again, instead of feeling like, you know, you're just a, a flag in the wind, you know, flapping around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. Excellent. Well, Linda, I am so appreciative of your time. I'm so um, glad that you made this time to be with us. Um, folks know how to get a hold of you now. So I encourage anybody that's listening to make sure that you reach out to Linda, find out what she has to offer and take control of your life, you know, and, and stop letting those three bandits be in the driver's seat, you know, of your, <laughs> of your life. And so I just want to thank everybody for joining us today as well. And be sure and join us again uh, for our next Women Lead webinars where these are designed to bring you rich information, rich, powerful uh, tools that you can use in your life right now. So Linda, thank you again. And I just want to say goodbye to everybody and uh, hope that you have a fabulous week and uh, and go out and take care of your life. Take care yes. of what you need to do. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me and, and for all the people who have joined. Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure. All right. Take care, Linda. Bye, right. everybody. Bye-bye.